Welcome back to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular Podcast Series, Interviews with the Experts. I'm your host, Sharon Hayes. I'm a non-invasive cardiologist and vice chair of faculty development and academic advancement for the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine here in Rochester, Minnesota. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Alan Lewis, who is Associate Professor of Medicine, co-director of the Pericardial Disease Clinic here in Rochester. He also leads a number of clinical trials related to treatment of inflammatory pericarditis. Today, our topic is contemporary management strategies and recurrent pericarditis. Welcome, Alan. Thank you very much, Dr. Hayes, for the invitation and the opportunity to discuss this important topic with you. Dr. Lewis is going to share with us contemporary management strategies for recurrent pericarditis, including indications and limitations of the IL-1 receptor blocker therapy. He'll also discuss the role of radical surgical pericardiectomy in the treatment of patients with recurrent pericarditis. So to start with, tell us which is the this problematic patient population that we're going to really be focusing on today. That sounds great. So we're really looking at the patients that are called to have recurrent pericarditis or complicated pericarditis. And this term really refers to people that have had more than one episode of inflammatory pericarditis. So you have those patients with acute pericarditis, they have their one episode, it goes away and it never comes back again. And that is ideal. But we all know that there's a proportion of people, even up to a quarter or a fifth of patients that have pericarditis that comes back again and again and again. And the spectrum of recurrent pericarditis really is quite broad it tends to be those patients that have frequent flares after their initial episode. But sometimes patients can have flares of pericarditis that are a number of years apart or really longer durations than that apart. But really the topic of interest or the patients of interest are those patients that tend to have a cluster of flares of pericarditis all in close succession uh, and close together. So You've got somebody in your pericardial disease clinic, and you and I both work there and see these challenging patients. What's your initial approach when they come in to first-time visit and they've had one or more recurrences? So that's a great question. And I think the first thing to do is to step back, take the clinical history again, examine the patient again carefully. Because what I've noticed is we're all in this paradigm in medicine where we're told and taught that if something has happened before, it's most likely to be the cause that happens again. But when you step back and look at it, you sometimes realize that there are a number of people who, yes, had an episode of pericarditis a long time ago. Yes, they had a recurrence of pericarditis, but now they have chest pain that's labeled as pericarditis and they don't actually have pericarditis anymore. They have musculoskeletal chest pain. They feel overly sensitive in their chest because they've had these previous things to worry about and a variety of other causes. And so I think confirming your diagnosis, first of all, is the most important approach to pericarditis. And then comes the treatment approach. So when we come to the treatment approach, the important thing to look at is to really start at the bottom of the ladder every time you have a flare and then work your way up the ladder. There is no reason if you get a a flare of pericarditis resolved to start at the top of the ladder because your previous uh, intervention didn't work. And so really in all my patients, I try to start wherever possible using a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory in conjunction with colchicine and exercise restriction in those patients. And exercise restriction is really important and it's often underdone. We forget to tell our patients not to exercise during an acute flare of pericarditis. And that's really important. I started a good dose of either uh, any of the non steroidal anti inflammatories at a good dose or aspirin at a dose of about a gram three times a day. Colchicine, you really want to dose well. You want to give as much colchicine as they will tolerate. And really, the recommended dose, if you're over about 70 kilograms, is a dose of 0.6 milligrams twice a day. And so by and large, most people tolerate their colchicine just fine, and that really vastly decreases your rate of recurrence. In those patients who don't calm down uh, with just a non steroidal anti-inflammatory and colchicine, then you really have multiple options now in, as to how to treat them. And if you go to different experts throughout the country or throughout the world, different people will advocate for different next steps in the treatment of pericarditis. The traditional next step in the treatment of 
pericarditis has been to go to a corticosteroid, namely prednisone, in combination with colchicine, and to use that in the treatment of pericarditis. If you choose that approach and choose to give prednisone, it's important to start at a low dose. And you're really looking for 0.25 milligrams per kilogram. And my typical starting dose is between 20 milligrams and 40 milligrams. It takes longer for the pain to resolve than if you go to a higher dose up front. But I really find if you have patients and wait a couple of days, the 20 milligram dose is quite efficacious along with colchicine in combination. And so starting on steroids, it is, if you choose to embark on steroids, it's really important to recognize that this is a long-term treatment strategy. You can't give an asthma dose pack regime of treatment and have your patient off steroids in two weeks because you have insufficient suppression of inflammation. And if you try and wean your therapy too quickly, those are the patients that recur. And so I would check inflammatory markers, ensure normalization of inflammatory markers, and then really slowly taper my patient off the prednisone at a dose of 2.5 milligrams every two weeks or so. So I would come down in 2.5 milligram increments every two weeks. And then when I hit the 10 milligram mark, I would consider slowing my taper even further. So let me let me just um, I guess I really want to um, to emphasize the need to take that history, right? I mean, I've had somebody who had pericarditis in the past referred to pericardial disease clinic who really needed a stent. I mean, they were having exertional pericardial pain, which turned out to be their tight LAD lesion. So really important. One thing you didn't mention it is something that we routinely do low yield, but how important is making sure that this isn't somebody who has undiagnosed lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, or the patient who comes in who we know they have that condition? Um, are, are, are we going to focus just on the truly idiopathic here, or do you have something to say about those who likely have an, under, an underlying cause or targeted cause? That's a great point there, Dr. Hayes, and thank you very much for bringing that up. So yes, in your examination, it is widely important to make sure that they don't have an autoimmune cause for their pericarditis. They don't have um, an, any other cause for their pericarditis, and really to examine them carefully, see if there is any evidence that makes you suspect autoimmune disease. Also, uh, in some cases, you would consider a panel of autoantibody testing and potentially want to want to screen for myeloma as a potential unusual cause. Um, but really, that's guided by the history and the examination. Where you identify that patients have an autoimmune cause for pericarditis, really treatment should be geared towards that autoimmune cause. And all the data that applies for idiopathic pericarditis really doesn't apply to those patients with autoimmune disease and therapy should be targeted to the underlying cause there. Let's shift gears a little bit to some of these new medications that some people are a little less familiar with using beyond steroids. When do you use IL-1 receptor blockers? So I think that there are two potential avenues for where I would use an IL-1 receptor blocker. The first is in my patients on steroid therapy already who fail to come off steroid therapy. So I've tried and tried, and every time I wean them down, they flare and you really have no other choice but to escalate therapy to something else in order to get them off if you've tried a really slow taper and not really been successful in getting your patient off steroid therapy. Some would advocate in patients with severe inflammation on a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory and colchicine that an IL-1 receptor blocker may be a reasonable next step where in your experience, you know that you're unlikely to get this patient off steroids and steroids are likely to be problematic. And then, of course, there are those patients with contraindications to steroids or patients that have quite a lot of side effects for steroids in whom you would consider using an IL-1 receptor blocker up front. And so those are really the three groups. It's sort of an individualized decision the 2015 uh, European Society of Cardiology Guidelines had placed uh, IL-1 receptor blockade below corticosteroids on their treatment algorithm as the next step. But really, this paradigm, uh, this treatment paradigm has shifted, and there has been a move to avoid steroid side effects, avoid the difficulties of weaning steroids, and really to use these earlier on. And I really don't think that there's a right or a wrong approach, whether you use steroid first or whether you use an IL-1 receptor blocker first. 
And sometimes it seems to um, depend upon the difficulty or lack thereof of getting the um, reimbursement for these very expensive medications. Absolutely. Yes, these medications can be incredibly expensive. It depends on the patient's insurance and coverage and things like that, that really do play a significant role as well. So say you've committed to an IL-1 receptor blocker um, and, uh, you know, aside from the, the limitation of getting it into the patient's hands, but what are some of the limitations um, or cautions that we need to consider when we're using these medications? So really, when we start the therapy, I think it's really important to keep in mind that you really want to exclude infection. And so in these patients, I will routinely screen for hepatitis B and C. I will routinely screen for HIV. And I will do tuberculosis testing in all my patients that I put on these IL-1 receptor blockers. They really are quite potent immunosuppressants, and they really do risk unmasking these conditions. The medication is generally contraindicated in those people with a history of malignancy or recent active malignancy because that immunosuppression is thought to increase the risk of progression of cancer. And so those are the things that I really think about when I, when I think about putting a patient on these medications. The limitations, I've generally found these medications to be highly effective when you put people on it, they get relatively rapid resolution of chest pain. They get relatively rapid resolution of symptoms. They do incredibly well when they're on them. But in saying that, there are a few patients that I've had that have managed to have flares of pericarditis despite these medications. So just because they have a flare of symptoms does not mean that this is not pericarditis or that the treatment will necessarily be completely ineffective. So to keep that in mind. And the other, really the big limitation that I worry about is the duration of treatment. I think that's a big unknown at the present time, but traditionally use some for 12 months, some for 18 months. And the data seems to suggest that there is an incredibly high risk of recurrence following discontinuation of an IL-1 receptor blocker uh, in terms of recurrent pericarditis occurring after these episodes. If we look at the data from Anna Kinra uh, that was published in the um, in the uh, IRAP registry that we were involved in, and you can see really there was sort of a up to 50% rate of, of recurrence or, or even more in some cases. And when we look at comparable data with Rolanosep, we see a very, very similar rate with the only case series or published from the end of the Arapsidy study showing as much as a 20, as much as a 75% rate of recurrence and just 25% freedom from recurrent episodes of pericarditis. And so that's really where I see challenges challenges in management, it's when the patient is ready to come off treatment and you're left with the paradigm of, do you stay on this lifelong? Do you come off this? What do we do with you at this point? That kind of transitions what's left after that. So one thing that is left, uh, but less often used is radical pericardiectomy. So when, when do you consider surgery for a patient with recurrent pericarditis? Is it ever right at the beginning, you know, before trying all these medications? Is it only after failure? Sort of tell me what's your thought process. Absolutely. So I, I think really this is a very important discussion to have with the patient. I find it very important to be honest with your patient up front. And, you know, I often talk to them about the challenges of an IL-1 receptor blocker at the end of their therapy. Really, in all my patients, I would have tried and failed a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory and culture scene before I consider surgery. I think that's fairly basic, run-of-the-mill, usual medical therapy. Um, when it comes to next steps, I would have tried either steroid or an IL-1 receptor blocker before I consider surgery. In terms of those patients that are coming off steroids and failing to come off steroids, I really offer them an option. I offer them the option of either having cardiac surgery for pericardectomy or moving on to an IL-1 receptor blocker. And the reality is, by and large, most patients want to avoid surgery, and so they're all keen to try an IL-1 receptor blocker. It's few and far between that you find a patient who has just had enough of medications and just wants to be off medication altogether. They don't want to be an injectable, and they choose surgical pericardectomy fairly early on in their, in their treatment paradigm, and, and that is reasonable as well. 
There are patients that have contraindications to an IL-1 receptor blocker, as we discussed earlier, infection and malignancy, who would be treated better with a surgical pericardectomy if steroids are not working, and those patients that have side effects to both sets of agents. And as I mentioned earlier, the handful of patients that do have true episodes of recurrent pericarditis with elevated inflammatory markers uh, despite uh, adequate therapy with an IL-1 receptor blocker. So um, I know uh, we're hoping to have our surgical colleagues to give us more information about the surgery and outcomes, but you know, what in your experience is the symptom-free or recurrence-free um, outcomes of patients who have a radical pericardiectomy? Because even though it's radical, we know we leave some of that tissue there. And, and, uh, and, and I think that how do we counsel patients when they're making that choice? Absolutely. And so one of the things that you just mentioned, Dr. Hayes, that I want to highlight is that pericardectomy really needs to be done by a surgeon with expertise doing pericardectomies, not for constrictive pericarditis, but rather for recurrent pericarditis. The reason I say this is the traditional pericardectomy is an anterior and inferior pericardectomy. It's called complete, but it's anything but complete when you leave all the pericardium posteriorly along the lateral wall of the left ventricle. And so really you need to find a surgeon with expertise in uh, pericardectomy that can truly strip the pericardium in its near entirety, uh, barring what runs along the phrenic nerves and barring the little bit between your pulmonary veins. And so really you need an expert surgeon that does a lot of these and is capable of doing these. The long-term outcomes after surgery are extremely good. Patients do well. And when and the only real data published in this patient population is from our colleagues here at Mayo Clinic that looked at their experience doing radical pericardectomy in patients with uh, recurrent pericarditis. In that particular study, the operative mortality was exceedingly low, and the risk of perioperative complications was also extremely low. But what is really interesting to see is the marked improvement in 10-year progression-free survival, 10-year uh, recurrence-free survival, and that is over 90% at 10-year follow-up, and far exceeds those people that were managed with traditional medical therapy with steroids and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So really, these patients do extremely well. And they, if their pericardectomy is done right, you're really looking at a 90% or so freedom from recurrence at 10 years. I, I think you've really provided us with a comprehensive approach. Now, you've made it seem simple. And these patients are, in my experience, very tough because no one's the same. But I, I think that if we think about this the way you have is making sure that you've got the proper diagnosis, that we start with the basics um, and then move forward and, and escalate, so to speak, and keeping surgery in the right hands on, on the table uh, for folks, um, uh, they will do better, I think, than they have uh, traditionally done, many of whom have really suffered either from the recurrence or the side effects of steroids. That's absolutely right. I really want to thank you for, for joining us today, uh, Dr. Lewis. This wraps up this week's episode of Interview with the Experts. Um, we'd really like, we've enjoyed discussing this important topic, and I hope we will hear more, particularly some of the details about surgical outcomes in the future. We look forward to you joining us again next week for another Interview with the Expert. Be well. <music>